Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our TED Talk today. We are Valentina and Kalina. We're both in the medical device engineering world, and we're working to solve for female pain. Our talk today is going to be on the topic of one of the greatest gender-based inequalities of them all, which is the gender gap in medical research and healthcare. A quick disclaimer before we proceed with the presentation, you're going to hear us use the word woman a lot today. And that's because the medical papers that we will be quoting do not differentiate between the different gender identities that exist. So what is the gender gap in healthcare? You've all probably heard about the gender pay gap and the gender gap in looking after household chores. But today we're going to tell you about a much more important one, the one in innovation and medical research. Did you know that it wasn't until 1993 that women were first allowed to participate in clinical trials? So it's been less than 30 years since women were first allowed to take part in modern medical research. What this means on a very practical level is that the majority of medications we use today Things like painkillers, sleep aids, anti-inflammatories were never designed for or tested on the female physiology. What's even more shocking is that even medications that were designed specifically for women have not been tested on women. Did you know that you can get a novel drug approved by regulators, which is designed for women but only tested on men in clinical trials. We know it sounds absurd and slightly scary, but it's true. Take a look at Adi, the female Viagra, and of course they made it pink. Adi was approved after being tested in only 25 patients, 23 of which, or 92%, were men. Yes, as Kalina said, of course they had to make it pink. It's the female Viagra, of course. Um, 92% of the research participants were men. Another really key example of the gender gap in healthcare is that it takes women a lot longer to get diagnosed with common diseases. The study that we're quoting here was based on 7 million Danish health records, which were obtained over the course of 21 years. And it shows that on average, women get diagnosed later than men in over 700 different diseases. For cancer, it takes women four and a half years later to get a diagnosis. And for diabetes, it's two and a half years more than men. This is really precious time that could be used to treat women instead of for them to wait for diagnosis. To further illustrate the gender gap in medical innovation, we only need to look at period pain. 90% of women experience it, yet no localized treatment has ever been developed. At the same time, male conditions like erectile dysfunction, which affect only 19% of men, receive the lion's share in clinical focus and research funding. While period pain might seem like an unimportant problem or a simple inconvenience, it's not. And the lack of innovation actually creates additional risks for the women who suffer from it. Just take a look at MIDO. It's one of the most commonly prescribed medications for the 90% of women that experience period pain. It turns out that if you take it every month, you become dependent on it, just as you can become dependent on opioid drugs. The same applies to the majority of over-the-counter painkillers, things like ibuprofen, neurofen, I'm sure all of you have used one of those to treat your menstrual pain. If you use them every month, they come with a number of severe side effects, which come from the fact that painkillers were never designed for or tested on the female physiology. Here on the screen, you can see just some of those side effects. This lack of innovation exists despite the fact that researchers from University College London have discovered that period pain can be just as painful as having a heart attack. Speaking of heart attacks, even though coronary disease is the leading cause of mortality in women, women are 50% more likely to get misdiagnosed with a heart attack. Now, you may wonder why. It's because doctors are only trained to recognize the heart attack symptoms that appear in the male physiology. 
so they do not know how to recognize the heart attack symptoms that appear in a woman. As a result, many women that show up to emergency rooms while having a heart attack get turned away and sent home because doctors do not know how to recognize their symptoms. We couldn't simply go without talking to you about contraception. Did you know that 60% of women who use hormonal contraception discontinue it after six months of using it due to the severity of the side effects? A few months ago, Valentina and I decided to dig deeper into these statistics. We launched a survey asking 13,000 women about their experience with hormonal contraception. What we found was truly shocking, but it's probably not going to be a surprise to the women in this room. 86% of the 13,000 women we surveyed said that for them it was more important to stop the severe side effects that they were experiencing from hormonal contraception than the efficacy of the contraceptive itself. What was even more heartbreaking is that a lot of the women had started considering sterilization as a preferred method of contraception due to how badly they were feeling from using modern contraceptives. Here's just a few quotes. All of the options kind of suck, and I wish there was something better. Sterilization seems like the only option for me, as I have had horrible issues with all other types of contraception. There is currently no good method, and I've tried most, which is why I eventually settled on sterilization. And one final quote, which many of the women here might relate to. It always seems to be up to the woman to take the lead and find the right contraceptive for her. In fact, it's women that have to carry the burden of contraceptive choices altogether. Because apart from the condom, there aren't any male-focused contraceptives. Now, you may wonder why. Why hasn't anyone invested in creating a male birth control pill? Well, people have. But the clinical studies looking into these contraceptives for men were stopped because of these side effects. Nausea, dizziness, increased appetite, and weight gain. All of these side effects are really well known to any woman that has ever used hormonal contraception. And in fact, they're very common today on the market for all of the approved contraception forms for women. So we have to ask, why are certain forms of contraceptive side effects acceptable for women, but not acceptable for men? For decades, biomedical researchers have assumed that women and men experience conditions and treatments identically. And for decades, we've known that this simply isn't true. Women differ with, from men in the way they experience different conditions, in the way they experience symptoms, and in the prevalence. Imagine what that means for conditions that only affect women. Let's take a look at endometriosis. It's a condition that affects one in 10 women, and it costs the British economy 2.4 billion each year. Yes, that's billion. It takes 10 years to diagnose on average, and it's no surprise that it takes so long, because research into endometriosis is severely lacking. Just take a look at one of the largest studies into endometriosis ever. It wasn't very helpful for patients at all. It looked at the correlation between how attractive a woman was perceived to be and how likely she was to have endometriosis. Would you like to know what the results were? Let me read it out for you. Women with endometriosis were judged to be more attractive. Moreover, they had a linear silhouette, larger breasts, and had sex for the first time at an earlier age. How this data is useful for women with endometriosis is beyond us. And yet, this is a peer-reviewed published article. Imagine if there was a study that actually helped women understand their condition and diagnose it earlier, instead of being the target of over-sexualization. To bring it home, we'd like you to meet the speculum. I know what you're thinking. No, this is not a medieval torture device. And it's not something really outdated that no one really uses anymore. This is, in fact, the central tool used in every gynecological exam today. It has had the same design since it was first used in the Roman Empire. The speculum causes vaginal tearing and bleeding, 
and it's quite painful to resolve the insert and remove. So why is this happening? Why is there such a massive gender gap in healthcare? It starts exceptionally early. Turns out that researchers not only prefer to have men in their clinical trials, they also prefer to have male mice over female mice in the early preclinical studies. There's also a large gap in the funding that goes towards female health, both public and private. In fact, less than 2.5% of public funding goes towards female health. At the same time, even when there is meaningful innovation that reaches market, it's impossible for it to be commercialized. I bet many of you don't know this, but Facebook and other large social media platforms routinely censor female health content. This is an investigation by the New York Times, which looked at 60 different female health companies, all of which had their ads banned for using the words vagina, menstruation, breastfeeding, all while at the same time talking about erectile dysfunction and Viagra is totally fine. Here's an example of one of our ads that we have had banned. So this is just a tampon wrapper, nothing cynical, nothing to be afraid of. But according to Facebook's algorithms, this is political content, and it was placed in the same category as ads for, wait for it, drugs, guns, and violence. The lack of female data in healthcare isn't just wrong. It can be fatal. So how can we meaningfully move the needle and disrupt this kind of depressing status quo? Firstly, let's start by increasing the percentage of public funding that goes through to reproductive health. Did you know that only 2.5% of public funding went towards reproductive health, even though more than 33% of women will experience an issue like that throughout their lifetime? Apart from lobbying for more public health funding towards female-specific diseases, we should all be lobbying for more venture capital to go towards supporting female founders. It's only 2.3% of all venture capital globally that goes to women-led companies. And it's female founders that are more likely to work towards female health innovation. So let's put our heads together and imagine a new world a world where healthcare is equal to both genders. A world where women that are experiencing heart attacks do not get turned away from hospitals. A, women, a world where the funding that goes to male-specific conditions matches that that goes to female-specific conditions. We believe that this is entirely possible. We're way past the era of considering menstrual and vaginal health a taboo. It's time we demand medical equality. And medical equality starts with language equality. The female body, while often exploited for profit and over-sexualized, is nothing to be ashamed of. While the word vagina might make many people feel uncomfortable, including researchers, ad executives on Facebook, and let's face it, some of the people in this room, it is not a curse word. This is why we invite you to speak openly and honestly about your female health experiences. Here's a few of the ways in which you can do that. The next time you're walking down the street and your period just started, you need to walk into a random restaurant or a cafe, you need to speak to the person behind the bar or maybe to the restaurant's manager so you can use their facilities. Tell them that it's because you need to change your tampon. Don't make up an elaborate lie. Don't hide tampons up your sleeve. The next time you need to miss a day of work because your period cramps are so severe, tell your manager that that's the real reason you won't be coming into the office that day. If you're ever having painful sex, which prevents you from orgasming, be open with your partner about it. Don't live in shame, don't live in lies. The only way in which we're going to break the stigma that surrounds female healthcare is by being open and honest about the experiences that we all share we're going to have to do another thing, which is we all need to add the word vagina to our daily vocabulary. So to end this talk, Kalina and I have an ask from everyone in the room. <laughs> On the count of three, join us in saying the word vagina out loud. 
One, two, two three, three, vagina! vagina. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.